They say the planet is just one big coin-operated perpetual motion machine. But money doesn't make the world go round, credit does. Why collect flattened cotton fibres with dead people on them when you can shoot photons out of an electric rectangle to spend money that isn't yours yet? Whether it's for a car, rent or life-saving medical treatment, the banks have never been happier to let you accumulate debt. While that's very nice of them, they will want their money back at some point, along with all the interest that they've pre-approved you to fall into. With hidden fees, eye-watering APRs and eye-straining small print, they will suck as much money as they can out of you while you're still horizontal. Okay. But this is nothing new. Credit has been with us for longer than coins. In fact, the only reason that someone invented cash in the first place was to keep track of all that credit. Around 5,000 years ago, when civilization was still rolling into existence, ancient Mesopotamia was the place to be. Sumerian society literally set up shop in present-day Iraq as humanity's centre of trade and agriculture. It promptly popularised things like wearing shoes, getting drunk, and maths, which was necessary to keep track of whose round it was. Credit was recorded on individual clay tablets, meaning that in ancient times money were just inscrutable numbers on a rectangle with your name on it. But if your harvest was bad or you swapped your supplies for beer, you'd risk having to fork your family members over as collateral. It could be argued that providing and recording credit is actually the foundation to any functional civilization. Because if you can't agree on who owes who what, that's when things start to get a bit stabby. It was a similar situation in ancient Babylon, where the earliest surviving laws on borrowing money were written in the Code of Hammurabi. Ancient Babylonians kindly set maximum interest rates, and every loan had to be witnessed by a local official. Though, again, failure to pay back your loan could result in three years of forced labour, for you or for the wife and or children you could sell in your place. Although the merciful King Hammurabi did make sure that you'd be freed after three years. Once someone invented money that you could jangle in the 6th century BC, things got a lot easier. The ancient Greeks and Romans handed out coins, largely to facilitate cross-cultural trade and to spread their imperial influence. Roman emperors helpfully printed their faces on their coins so their subjects would know who to hand them back to when tax season came along. While coins were all the rage in the Roman Empire, large transactions were still done with credit, as it would otherwise mean handing over a wheelbarrow's worth of Augustuses, which would have been inconvenient as there weren't that many coins in circulation and no one had invented the wheelbarrow yet. It was at this point I realised that the history of credit is basically the history of humans. So let's fast forward a few centuries. First of all, the Roman Empire falls and some new religions pop up that don't approve of lending money. This era of religious piety and illiteracy is commonly known as the Dark Ages because everyone was poor and stupid. That changed in the 1300s when God decimated one third of his most adoring fans with the Black Death. While this was probably the worst event in human history so far, the bright side was that those who survived made lots of money. Post-plague, wages for ordinary people went up for the first time ever, so they could afford gaudy things like more food and precious, precious silk. Due to there being fewer people around, many innovations in automation were made. People made better tools, had better ideas, and built bigger ships to escape their disease-ridden countries. Some of them made it to the New World, where they swapped their fancy European diseases for some precious metals and exotic flavour dusts. Banks handed out more loans for these spice-finding missions, and global trade exploded. Businesses got so profitable that some of them were even able to take over entire subcontinents with their own armies. Businesses had access to lines of credit with easy interest payments for centuries, but the hopeful consumer, as in someone who wanted to hopefully consume some bread, had to make do without. Speaking of which, I've got some bills to pay. Hey you! Are you terrified and bewildered by a modern world that you can neither control or understand? Well why don't you flick the bean into your morning routine by subscribing to Morning Brew. <sighs> morning Brew is a free daily newsletter delivered Monday to Sunday, getting you up to date on business, finance and tech in just five minutes. 
Before the brew, I'd spend my AM waking up in the park that I accidentally fell asleep in the night before. But now I'm a successful businessman who owns over five fully operational jet skis. While traditional news is just failed actors spoon-feeding you their target demographic's preferred worldview, Morning Brew is witty, informative, and relevant to what's actually going on. I'm updated every morning on the businesses killing it in the market, and on all those money-losing logos being propped up by venture capital and the gig economy. Click the link below and subscribe so Morning Brew can pour piping hot knowledge into your eye holes every goddamn morning. Until the arrival of credit cards, if you wanted money from the bank that wasn't yours, you had to use consumer credit. In comparison, the 19th century had been a lot tighter with its cash, in part because of a Puritan culture of thrift, and because there was a lot less cool shit to buy. The early 20th century had seen US factories pump out washing machines, furniture, refrigerators and radios, all of which could be bought on instalment plans. Banks were happy to hand out loans directly to consumers as they fast became one of their most lucrative sources of income. Before approving your loan though, the bank would have to look at your wages and your face, because back in those days, your local bank branch manager probably knew who you were and whether you could be trusted. But when those sexy, shiny new Model Ts started driving off the assembly line for the first time, most families hadn't saved enough to afford one, but still wanted one. By 1918, General Motors loaned consumers the money themselves. With just a 35% down payment, families could literally drive themselves into debt. And who can blame them? Exactly 100 years ago, everyone was just trying to have fun after that terrible global pandemic. So people distracted themselves with crazy new dance trends, pearl-clutching moral panics, and getting rich from wild speculation on the stock market. You know, like in the now times. Banks had been dumping customer cash into a stock market that had been hitting dingers for decades. So to get more, they started to approve riskier and riskier loans. Anyway, all that happened just before the 1929 stock market crash, also known as the opening act to the Great Depression. Back in the real world, banks were running out of money and shuttering, meaning that ordinary people no longer had access to the savings that they may have taken a lifetime to accumulate. To ensure something like this would definitely never happen again, the government passed the United States Banking Act of 1933, which was passed to better separate commercial and investment banking. Essentially, it stopped banks from using as much of your money in their risky, speculative operations. As the banks got regulated, corporations, clients, and the humble hobo moved to new cities looking for work, while the government got all those unemployed bread wanters to build roads between them. With a newly hypermobile population still paying off the interest on that 10 year old rust bucket hunk of shit death trap Model T, people swap jobs and states more frequently. With everybody moving around, the bean counter at the bank probably didn't know who you were anymore. So they needed to find a new way to get all these dust-covered strangers into debt. In the 1940s, big oil companies had already created and proliferated proto-credit cards among their drivers to facilitate long, cashless journeys. The idea then spread to fancy retail stores who gave lines of credit to loyal or desirable customers to inspire brand loyalty. In 1949, proud businessman Frank McNamara finished a meal with clients, before realizing that he'd left his wallet in another suit. His wife covered the bill, but the lasting embarrassment would inspire him to change the world forever. He returned to Majors a year later with a piece of cardboard, which he convinced the owner to accept instead of money. Frank pulled that same trick with another 27 restaurants and two hotels, who all agreed to accept his new Diners Club credit card. It immediately became a high society status symbol that told the table that dinner was on you. Diners Club, we're just about everything. Diners Club, the first card. Diners Club. The same was true for the exclusive American Express card, made for the convenience of frequent air travelers. At first, credit was advertised as a lifeline, a way to access money you didn't have but needed right away. Awkward, relatable situations, like the aftermath of a non-specific maritime disaster, from which you were the sole survivor. 
To the jet set, it was a four inch status symbol that you could keep in your trousers and slap on the table after dinner, inspiring jealousy and awe. It made appeals to adventurousness, but it was mostly used by businessmen who were nervous about getting mugged between the airport and the airport Hilton. Cash, no, no credit cards. You had nothing. It was a card only for people who knew that tomorrow's paycheck would cover today's indulgence. This gave the card prestige, but it kept profits slim. Ask the obliging Bank of America for a jar of soothing instant money. M-O-N-E-Y. It would be Bank of America executive Joseph P. Williams who would first experiment with handing out an all-purpose credit card to the unwashed masses. It started in Fresno, California, where 60,000 households received a card and a $500 line of credit to spend across town. Fresno citizens gathered around checkout counters to watch people not pay for their groceries. Joe was so inspired by his own success that Bank AmeriCard was launched in Los Angeles before they really knew how Fresno's happy shoppers would handle their new debt rectangles. Just a year later, the Californian rollout of the first real credit card had led to widespread fraud and a $19 million loss for Bank of America. It taught the industry an expensive but valuable lesson. If someone who needs credit gets credit, they're probably going to spend it before they read the rules that the card came wrapped in. Joe and his team had underestimated the amount of delinquent accounts by about 500%, which wasn't ideal when they also hadn't bothered to set up a collections department. Joe resigned in minor disgrace. He had blown the launch of what would eventually become the bank's most profitable toy. But first they needed to find the right balance, getting users only to accrue the amount of interest that they could manage to pay off. For the first half of the 60s, only 10 new credit cards entered the market. But once Bank AmeriCard profits got too big to keep quiet, banks large and small got involved. Mass, unregulated card dumps would pile over 100 million credit cards on the nation's collective doormat over the next 12 years. Several regional banks got together to form MasterCharge, Bank AmeriCard's most successful rival. Eventually, MasterCharge became MasterCard and Bank AmeriCard turned into Visa, both now independent from the banks that created them. They are now sort of like the middlemen, profiting by facilitating these card payments, but they don't make any money on interest. That is still the business of the banks. The banks did try to wrestle control away from Visa and MasterCard and hemorrhaged money in the attempt. Even in a blizzard, the city never sleeps. The city never sleeps, city bank. Citibank attempted to acquire pre-existing cards like the American Express imitator, Carte Blanche. The only card that gave free advertising to its competitors, inexplicably presenting itself as the card you got when you were done collecting all the others. I have a Carte Blanche card. But I need an American Express card and a bank card too. Because there isn't any one credit card in the world that's accepted everywhere, not even carte blanche. That's why I carry these. Everyone should have at least three of the best credit cards in the world, including me. And I'm the president of carte blanche. Citibank ended up losing over $500 million on its credit card operations alone between 1979 and 1981. MasterCharge, though, broke through with an ingenious campaign that just focused on the magical technology that allowed you to IOU a Chevrolet Monte Carlo. Chevrolet invites you to think of yourself in a new Monte Carlo. The company found even more success when they started advertising their card as a totem of personal empowerment and clout. Do you take postage stamps? <laughs> you take MasterCharge, don't you? MasterCharge, of course. You've just seen clout in action. Master Charge wants to give you all the clout you're working for. So when you shop, you can say... I'm in charge. That's real clout. When you carry Master Charge... Thanks to cheaper competition from abroad, American industrial jobs declined heavily in the mid-1970s. The OPEC oil embargo sparked a deep recession and energy shortages across the Western world. Flush with billions in embargo bucks, the Gulf state then dumped petrochemical dollars in stable institutions like US banks. 
Citibank more than covered its credit card losses as deposits rose from 45 billion to 70 billion in just four years. Despite getting everyone into debt, banks were still struggling to make any money on their credit card operations. As years of nearly double figure inflation and restrictions on interest rates kept a stranglehold on profits. Luckily, good fortune was just around the corner for the banks. The industrial sector was still shedding employees like waste metal, meaning that there were a lot fewer union jobs to go round. So the next generation would grow up in a job market with unstable employment and fewer insured benefits like healthcare and an education. This change would finally usher in an era of unprecedented profits for the banks, as it turned huge swathes of Americans into their perfect creditors. Every credit card user falls somewhere on what I like to call the sucker spectrum. On the far left here we have the sensible and or affluent credit card user. For them the card is just a convenience. They pay their bills every month and never accrue interest. And banks hate these people because they don't make any money off them unless they have a fancy card with a high annual fee. The banks call these people deadbeats even though they're anything but. On the other side of the spectrum are the suckers who play themselves. People who accrue so much credit card debt that they never fully pay it off. People who declare bankruptcy or die in debt. Now the bank doesn't like these people either, but luckily the losses that they accrue are mitigated by the large portion of suckers who live on their left. This is the bank's ideal credit card user. Someone who accrues a pretty decent chunk of interest and takes their sweet time in paying it back. Maybe they have a low wage job and they're living paycheck to paycheck, and they'll probably miss a few payments during periods of unemployment, bad health, or um, careless stupidity. And in the following decade, banks learn how to reel these suckers in. In the early 1980s, factories were shuttering across the Western world, as brand new ones were springing up in the East to make cheap plastic crap for these newly smooth-handed service economies. Countries where economic growth was now highly dependent on consumer spending. Faced with declining real wages and corporate downsizing, a shoe-faced ex-actor presided over a wave of financial deregulation. For the first time in American history, there were now no legal restrictions on the interest rates that banks could charge on their credit cards. They could also approve them for whoever they wanted, and they could pretty much buy you anything you wanted at the mall. The Discover card was introduced by Sears in 1985 as the People's Card, free for anyone who was willing to stomach its then very high 18.9% APR. It was marketed alongside aspirational images of roided up pole graspers with choirs proclaiming your freedom to blow your paycheck ahead of time. This was a decade-long trend in advertising. Credit cards were now tickets to a world of luxury and instant gratification. In the same year, MasterCard decided subtlety was for cowards, acting like they were handing out free, round-the-world tickets to Botox-blasted yuppies. I bought my bubbles in Bimini. <laughs> I bought my skis in Aspen. No, Switzerland. So worthy, so welcome. I bought my tan in Spain. Olay. Now that everyone was carrying plastic, the real victims weren't the debt-saddled masses, but the rich who no longer felt special because their pockets were quiet. Companies that charge an annual fee were forced to find other ways to turn their products into status symbols. Flight 139 leaving in 20 minutes, but only in first class. I'll take it. The American Express card contains a single word that makes every other card seem like just a piece of plastic. Member. American Express massaged their members to satisfaction with free air miles and other benefits. Other large banks created their own premium cards, sparking a decades-long benefit war between companies who were competing for wealthy wallet space. 
They offer discounts on luxury brands, membership point schemes, access to airport lounges, low interest or no interest for extended periods. Banks, today and then, frequently lose money in trying to seduce rich clients to their premium cards. But the profits made on the high interest cards for the rest of us more than subsidize these benefits. In other words, the money made from the average debt muncher was providing discounts for smug 90s icons and their 16-year-old girlfriends. Congratulations, you are one millionth shopper! I love this card. Look, I know what some of you are thinking right now. If you get into credit card debt, isn't that your fault? The rules of the game come wrapped around the card you play it with, so if you go on a spending spree before you read them, isn't that kind of on you? The reckless credit card user, unable to resist the urge to shop, gamble and snort their way into debt, is a useful figure for the industry. If credit is a game you lose by being bad, then its rules are fair, and it's your fault for agreeing to them. Nearly everyone plans to pay their card off. But life is more unpredictable than any of us like to think. Banks helpfully provide their minimum monthly repayments on their bills, appealing to our blind optimism. But the only reason they do this is to maximize your opportunity to fuck up or get fucked over. By losing your job or getting sued, divorced or cancer, you'll probably miss a few payments and accrue some interest. It is in this manner, rather than through reckless spending, that people find themselves on the south side of the sucker spectrum. By the time the Hoff was singing the Cold War's swan song, Americans were borrowing more money than at any time in history. For many, credit was now the most friction-free way to provide household essentials and to solve emergencies. By 1995, America's average personal savings rate had plummeted to an all-time low. And this isn't too surprising, given that the price of things like homes and a higher education were soaring. In 1989, a FICO credit score became the only way to convince the bank to let you own progressively larger chunks of the house that they buy for you. What previous generations had saved for were now out of reach for many households. But an N64? Well, that was just one swipe away. Citibank and most of its competitors were posting record profits, while their advertising departments tripled their budgets. Seeing tumbleweeds in their customer savings accounts, banks appealed to them by promoting cards with sweepstake promotions and charity giveaways, giving back to the lucky few some of the cash they'd been siphoning off them for the last 20 years. Satisfied with gobbling a nation's savings up month by month, the financial sector decided they wanted to take on more risk and lobbied for greater freedom. Persuading President Garment Soiler, the first president without direct memory of the Great Depression, to wipe away the last of that era's financial regulations. Banks were now allowed to bundle home, car and credit card debt and sell them as securities on secondary markets, creating increasingly complex and risky derivative contracts. But Madam Speaker, I believe this legislation in its current form will do more harm than good. It will lead to fewer banks and financial service providers, increased charges and fees for individual consumers and small businesses, diminished credit for rural America, and taxpayer exposure to potential losses should a financial conglomerate fail. But for the first seven years of the new millennium, the New Year ball would drop over the Discover logo, and the US personal savings rate dropped with it. New cards were rolled out with hidden fees and deceptive deferred interest rates. By this time, most people had figured out that credit was a game, but some were still convinced that the banks wanted you to win it. Reward programs are still seen by many as prizes for hard work and smart habits, when they're anything but. They are simply incentives to spend. A gravitational pull on the right side of the sucker spectrum which is where we'd all end up in 2008. 7% here, a loss of 37 points or so. Apple shares are just getting hammered this morning. This could be the most serious recession in decades. The first few days of a financial crisis make for fascinating television, as news anchors struggle with the 
abstract nature of the event. Down over 16%. Dow at the same time has fallen about 18%. Reporters struggling to be heard over traders screaming about graphs as if the x-axis might snap off and crash through the roof. Traders here working the phone say a lot of their customers are freaked out waiting to see how low the Dow will go. While some anchors were forced even to lament the linear nature of time itself. The opening bell is going to ring in uh, five seconds and to be honest with you we wish it wouldn't when the crisis hit the uk the event was initially referred to as the credit crunch but that didn't quite communicate the seriousness of a global financial fuck catastrophe sounded more like a budget breakfast cereal while the event was blandly and conveniently rebranded the banks who bought sold and created the credit what crunched were bailed out. Citibank themselves received a total investment of $45 billion and had $306 billion worth of risky assets guaranteed. But you know this story. Until very recently, it was the answer to the question, why is everything shit now? After the crash, for a while, banks gave up on pretending to be your friend, outsourcing their likability to Hollywood celebrities. Limits were put on hidden card fees by the Obama administration in 2009, but this has just made the industry more dependent on interest for profits. Credit card debt hit a record high for Americans in 2019, far outpacing the peak reached before the 2008 recession. Just before the pandemic, American Express had dusted off their old playbook to appeal to millennial aspirations of adventurous travel, or just their desire to escape debt slavery and go live in the fucking woods. Thanks for watching everyone. That video was super long, so I'll keep this short. Thanks to all the patrons for supporting me. Look out for some new exclusive content soon. And don't forget to like and comment on this video, which is now over.